Hi, I'm Dan Cordopassi. Welcome to Model Building. In this series, I'm reproducing a set of five locomotives that I saw in the front of a Southern Pacific freight train in 1993 in HO scale. In the last episode, I worked on the two SP SD45Rs in the Cotton Belt V30-7, detailing the rear of the long hood on each model. My goal this time is to install the fan bases and other major hood details on the SD45Rs as well as the Conrail SD40. Specifically, I want to correct 7479's rear light cluster, add major details to the long hoods of both SP SD45Rs, and add fans to Conrail 6283. After the last episode, one of the viewers pointed out that the rear light cluster on 7479 was incorrect. He referenced a publication from 1993 called SP Today. Ironically, I've had this book on my shelf since it was new, but I'd forgotten that right there on page 2 there's a picture of the rear of SP7479. It would be really awesome if there was some kind of cross-reference index out there that would tell you all the books to look at if you wanted a photo of a particular piece of equipment. Sometimes the research material is right under your nose but still hard to find. Anyway, it's a little hard to see in this photo, but 7479 has a single large cover plate where the oscillating lights used to be rather than the dual covers that I used. First, I need to pry off the incorrect cover plates. It's a bit of a pain, but it's a lot easier to make changes now than it would be after the model is painted. I'm using a number 17 X-Acto blade to very carefully pry off the covers. I'm working slowly so that I don't gouge the plastic light bracket. I want to keep that. I'll put the covers back in the detail parts bag where they came from and save them for a future project. A piece of scrap 040 styrene with a piece of 400 grit sandpaper wrapped around one end makes a good improvised sanding block. I'll give the bracket a light sanding to get rid of any glue marks. I can still see a trace of where the covers used to be, but this area will be mostly covered by the new plate so I think it'll look fine. Mostly I want to make sure that the surface is level so that the new plate will adhere better when it's glued. I don't want to sand too much and risk damaging the light mount. Unfortunately I don't know of anyone who makes a detail part for the larger cover so I'll need to make one. I looked in my box of supplies and found some 005 clear styrene. I'd prefer whiter colored plastic but this is what I have on hand so I'm using it. The material is thin enough to make a convincing cover plate. As luck would have it, there's already a strip of this material in the package that happens to be cut to the width that I need for the cover plate. I don't know what this scrap is left over from, but it will save a little time. I don't have any actual dimensions for the cover. I'm guesstimating the size from photos. The width is slightly narrower than the light mount box, or about a scale foot and a half. I'm estimating the height by placing it against the light mount and making a mark with my hobby knife. I put a fresh blade in my X-Acto knife and I'm gently scoring the part along the cut line. Using a glass cutting mat with a grid on it like this helps make it easier to make straight cuts. Before finishing the cut, I'll flip the part over and lightly sand one side. I'm trying to make it easier to see. I'll finish the cut by flexing the plastic along the cut line. The finished part is about one and three quarter scale feet tall. Unfortunately, it's still really hard to see this part, so I'm going to paint it. I only want to paint one side, so I've stuck it to a piece of blue painter's tape. I'm using some Tamiya Fine Surface White Primer. I don't normally like rattle can paint, but this primer goes on very thin, comparable to airbrush quality. After spraying the white, I'll follow up with some Tester's Gloss Coat. Now the part is easier to see and the glossy surface is ready for decals. I'll tack glue the part with some liquid styrene cement, then check the position. Once I'm happy with the positioning, I'll add a little more glue to hold it down permanently. There should be a slight gap around the edges. This is a strip of rivets cut from Archer decal sheet 88026. I'll need three individual rivet heads. For some reason I like to put decals on N-scale plastic model boxes when I wet them down. Any clean non-porous surface would do. I'll add a drop of water and let the rivets soak. I'll use some microscale microset on the cover plate to prepare the surface for decals. Next I'll position each rivet with the back side of my X-Acto blade. The rivets represent the three screws or bolts used to hold the cover in place on the prototype. Once the decals have had a chance to dry for a bit, I'll brush them with some Microsol. This will help the decals soften and bond to the model. The decal backing is thin enough that it won't show when the model is painted, leaving just the rivet detail. There, now 7479 has the correct light cover. Canon makes fans for most EMD diesels. There are several variations. For the SD45 radiator fans, I'll be using sets 1703 and 1705. These both have 9 blades per fan. The only difference is the grill style. 1703 has a pan top while 1705 has a plain grill. All the other parts are the same. Sets 1702 and 1704 are correct for SD40s. These both have 8-bladed fans. Again, the difference is in the grill style. 
I found a roof shot of Conrail 6283 from 1989, and at that time it had plain fangirls, so I'll be using set 1704. It was common for the fangirls to get mixed up as the locomotives went through the shops. I found a roof shot of 7479 that shows a pan top grill on the rearmost fan and plain grills on the others. On 7482, the frontmost radiator fan had a pan top. I'll need to mix and match parts from both sets for these engines. Canon also has dynamic brake fans. These have a shorter fan base than the radiator fans and they have more blades. Both of the sets that would work for this project, 1852 and 1853, have 10 bladed fans. As with the radiator fans, the difference is in the grill style. Since all three EMD locomotives in this build have plain grills, I'll be using set 1853 on each. All of the fans are put together the same way. I'd recommend working on the dynamic brake fans separately from the radiator fans as many of the parts are different. I'm going to work on the radiator fans first. I'll start by trimming any flash from the part. Next I'll cut a fan base from the sprue. Be very careful as these parts are fragile. Now I'll use my knife to clean up the cuts followed by a light sanding. At this point it's important to make note of the paint on the unit that you're modeling. The fan bases on some locomotives may be light gray or some other color while other fans may be the same color as the locomotive roof. The picture of 7479 in SP today makes it look like the middle radiator fan base might be light gray, but I have another roof shot of 7479 from the 1990s that makes it look like it's the same as the rest of the roof, or it could just be really dirty. In my photo the fan base looks dark, at least as much as you can see of it. I have another photo of 7479 that also looks dark. I'm going to go with the majority of my photos and paint the fan bases on 7479 the same SP dark gray as the rest of the roof. That means that I can glue them on now. If the fan base needed to be a different color, like on this SPGP35 that I built, I'd leave it off and paint it separately. Before installing the radiator fan bases, it's important to note the orientation. The support that's facing the flat part of the fan base is the front. Keeping things in the proper orientation will also ensure that the bolt pattern around the edges of the fan will be correct. According to the Canon instructions, on three fan units like the SD45s, the two rear fan bases should have the supports facing forward and the front fan should face backwards. The supports will be all but invisible once the fans are assembled, so it's up to you how much you want to worry about this. I like to put mine in the right way even though the supports really can't be seen later. More important is for the flat sides of the fans to be oriented front to back. When gluing the fan bases, I found it's useful to use a straight edge to make sure everything's lined up. I've test fit the fan bases to 7479. Once I'm satisfied with the fit, I'll glue them from the bottom using CA. Now I need to cut out the rest of the fan parts. The most difficult are the upper rings that hold the grills. These are extremely fragile. I'll start by very carefully trimming and filing away any flash. Be careful not to file away the bolt detail around the edges. Once I've got these cleaned up, I'll set them aside for the moment. The fan grills are attached to the fret in three places. I use the thicker back end of an X-Acto blade on a plate glass cutting surface to cut through these spots. I'll use a file to clean up excess material on the grill. Be very careful as these grills bend easily. There are a couple different ways that I've seen people assemble these fans. You can glue the upper ring to the top of the lower ring and then attach the grill later after the model is painted. I prefer to follow the instructions and use liquid styrene cement to attach the grill to the upper ring and paint it separately. The grills have a rougher feeling side and a smoother feeling side. The rougher side should face up. Sometimes I'll flip the upper ring and grill over on a piece of plate glass and press down gently to make sure that the grill is properly seated. Now I can cut out the fan hubs. I've stuck the upper grill assemblies and fan hub parts on a piece of blue painter's tape and written the engine number on it. For now I'll keep the fan blades on the fret to protect them. I've put all of these fan parts in 7479's project box. The dynamic brake fans go together the same way as the radiator fans. As I mentioned earlier, I'm using set 1853 on each model. The dynamic brake fan kit includes parts for risers. Those aren't needed for SD units, so I can put them in my scrap box. The instructions say that one set of supports should point left on the dynamic brake fans. Again, this won't really be very visible when the model is assembled. I pay more attention to the bolt pattern around the base of the fan, making sure that it's even on both sides. This is really hard to see, but the support that points left should have two bolts evenly spaced around it. 
Since these fans are in plastic holes, I'll use liquid styrene cement to tack glue them. Once again, I'll use a straight edge to make sure all the fans are lined up. When I'm satisfied with the position, I'll use some more glue to bond them permanently. I've prepped the rest of the fan parts the same way I did the radiator fans. These can now go into 7479's project box. The radiator fan installation on 7482 is exactly the same as for 7479. The dynamic brake fans are a little different since the Kato shell has a removable dynamic brake fan panel. As with 7479, I'm using liquid styrene cement to glue the fans in place. The wrinkle is that the cannon fans stick down lower than the bottom of the panel. Since the recess in the top of the shell is shallow, I'll need to drill a couple of holes to make room for the fan bases. I've used a sharpie to mark where I need to drill. I'll start by drilling a pair of small pilot holes. I'm going to use a step drill bit to ream out the holes. These make a nice clean cut. It looks like the part of the fan base that sticks down is a little less than a quarter inch in diameter, so I'll only need to drill down to the quarter inch mark. Uh-oh. In spite of my best efforts, one of the holes ended up off center. I drilled it out to the next step, 5 16 so that there would be enough clearance on all sides. Now I can test fit the dynamic brake fan assembly. It doesn't look so great right now with the hole off kilter, but most of this will be invisible once the model is finished. Before I glue the fan assembly to the rest of the shell, I'll brush some thin black paint into the recess. This isn't a great paint job, but it provides a little extra insurance to make sure no bare plastic will show through anywhere. The thin paint will make sure that there aren't any lumps that might interfere with the fit of the parts. Now that the paint has dried, I can attach the fan assembly permanently. First, I'll carefully press it into place. When I'm satisfied with the fit, I can glue it from the back using some liquid styrene cement. For the next step, I'll be installing the turbo exhaust and inertial filter hatches for both SD45s. I'll be using Canon part 1353 for the inertial filter hatches. I'll cut out the parts with my sprue cutters. Next, I'll trim any excess plastic with a hobby knife and file. On the SD45s, the rear of the inertial filter hatch should be even with the line on the engine body that marks the rear of the inertial filter compartment. The sides should be even with the sides of the shell. Once I'm satisfied with the placement, I'll tack glue the back edge with some liquid styrene cement. If you need to make any minor adjustments to the placement, do it now before the glue sets. Mine looks good, so I'm going to tack it down in front. Then I'll apply more glue from the underside. The turbo hatches are Canon part 1952. I'll use the same techniques to cut out these parts. The turbo hatch has a separate grill. When I'm satisfied with the fit, I'll glue it from the bottom using liquid styrene cement. There should be a slight gap between the turbo hatch and the inertial filter hatch. I'm using a scrap piece of O10 styrene to help align the parts. I'll tack glue this one from the side. Before gluing it down permanently, I like to sight down the shell to make sure that the edges of the inertial filter and turbo hatches line up. Also, the exhaust is offset slightly to the rear of the locomotive. When I'm happy with the placement, I'll glue it from below. Installing the turbo hatch and inertial filter hatch on 7479 is almost the same. The main difference is that the proto shell doesn't have holes in it in these areas to make it easy to glue from below. To remedy that, I'm going to drill a few small holes for that purpose. Otherwise, the parts fit the same way as they did on 7482. Now both SD45 long hoods have all the major details applied. I'll save adding smaller details like lift rings for a future episode. Since 6283 is already painted, before I can install the fans on that engine, I need to paint them. Just like with the two SD45s, I've put the fan parts on some painter's tape and labeled them with the engine number. The tape will make a convenient painting handle. Before I paint, I'll use a micro brush to clean the parts with some rubbing alcohol. This will help to remove any finger oils. I'll start by spraying the parts with some Tamiya Fine Surface White Primer. I painted the shell of 6283 some time ago. I'm fairly certain that I used either Floquil or Polyscale Conrail Blue. As it happens, I still have a bottle of the Polyscale Blue and it looks close to what's on the model. The big question is whether or not the old paint is still viable. This paint has been out of production for years and Polyscale doesn't always have the best shelf life. Thankfully, it looks like this paint is still okay. There aren't any big clumps clinging to my stir stick. I'll use a few drops of Windex to thin the paint for airbrushing. Now that everything is painted, I can see that the fan parts are slightly darker than the model. I may have added a bit of white to the paint when I airbrushed it on the engine. I remember trying to match the faded look in the photos. I had just enough paint left to try again. 
This time I mixed a bit of Tester's Model Master Acrylic White into the paint. It's still not quite perfect, but with some careful weathering, I think it should look all right. I don't have enough of the polyscale paint left to try a third time. This is a good argument for putting all the details you want on a model the first time around before it's painted. Then there's no issue with color matching. Installing the fans is just the same as it was on the SD45. I just have to be a little more careful with glue. Just like on the other models, two of the supports on the dynamic brake fan basis point left. When I'm satisfied with the positioning, I'll glue them from the bottom. The radiator fan bases are also installed the same way as on the SD45s. The frontmost fan has a support pointing backwards. The two rear fans have supports that point forwards, and the flat parts of the fan bases face front and back. I found that in this particular instance, using CA was sometimes more effective than liquid styrene cement. Regardless of what glue you use, apply it sparingly. You don't want to ruin the model at this point. Thin CA and liquid styrene cement are very runny, so as long as the parts are pressed tightly together, capillary action will draw the glue into the joint. A little goes a long way. Since the SD40 fan parts are now painted, I'm going to go ahead and assemble the fan blades and hubs. I'll start by removing the hub parts from the blue tape. I'm working on the dynamic brake fans first so that I don't get the parts mixed up with the radiator fan hubs. Once again, I'm using my piece of plate glass as a cutting surface for the photo etched metal parts. I'll use the heel of my X-Acto blade to cut the fan blades free from the fret. These parts are easily bent, so I'm gripping them carefully with some smooth jawed needle nose pliers to file off any excess metal. The fan hubs can be a tight fit, so you may need to file the mounting pin slightly until it fits easily through the hole in the blades. Don't force it. If the hub doesn't go through the fan easily, file it some more. Once the upper part of the hub is through, flip the fan over and put the backing part over the mounting pin. A little liquid styrene cement should hold everything together. The instructions say to twist each fan blade 15 degrees counterclockwise. I'll use my needle nose pliers and do one fan blade at a time. This is one step where it's good to get it right the first time. If you twist a blade too much, it can break off. Now it looks like a fan. The radiator fans go together exactly the same way. Now that I have all the fans assembled, I put them on a piece of blue tape. At this point, it's easy to tell the dynamic brake fans from the radiator fans because they have more blades. I'm going to spray the fan blade assemblies with some testers dull coat to give them a matte finish. Next, I'll apply some black weathering powder to the fan assemblies using a soft brush. The matte finish really helps the powder to adhere better. For the next step, I'll use some canopy glue since it's less risk to the model if I spill any. I'll put a drop on the bottom of each fan assembly, then install them on the fan bases. The fan bases are fragile, so be sure to support the center of the fan base from below when pressing the parts together. Now all the fans are installed. The tops of the blades should be at the same level as the top of the fan base. To keep them from getting accidentally knocked off, I'm going to wait to install the grills until the model is almost finished. For now, I'll put them into 6283's project box. Now all three EMD shells have their fan bases installed. I think this is a good place to stop for now. Both SD45 shells are at the same stage of completion and I made some good progress on the SD40. If you have a library of reference material or photos, make sure to check them before starting a project. If I'd found the photo of 7479 sooner, I wouldn't have had to redo the rear light cluster. I said this last time too, but I'll say it again. Making changes while the model is still being built is much easier to do than waiting till after it's finished. Having the wrong light cover on 7479 would bother me, so I'm glad I took the time to fix it now. Patience and care are necessary when dealing with small, fragile parts. It's very easy to damage parts like this, so take your time and work carefully. I'm pretty happy with the progress that I made in this episode. The locomotives are really starting to take shape. We'll pick it up again next time, and thanks for watching.